Hello, welcome back. In today's lecture, we're going to dive more into the concepts of covariance and correlation coefficients. We are going to first look at how do we calculate this um, sample statistics, and then we're going to see how we can apply this, how, how we can apply covariance and correlation coefficients to compute portfolio variance, and how does the covariance and correlation coefficient contribute to the overall risk of the portfolio. So first, we're going to look at covariance. Covariance um, measures whether or not when one stock outperforms its expectation, how does the other stock perform? The other stock can also outperform its expectation, or it can underperform its expectation. So it gives us a, an idea whether or not they tend to move together, or whether or not they tend to move in opposite directions. The formula for computing covariance is similar to what you have seen before. So notice that the formula is very similar to the formula for variance. We also use the notation sigma, but instead of sigma square, which is variance, we have sigma of A and B. So instead of looking at how A deviates from or stock A's return deviate from its expectation, we're looking at what, when stock A deviates from its expectation, how does stock B perform? So again, we have seen this many times, this Greek symbol sigma, or capital sigma means sum. So again, we have different scenarios. P here stands for probability. So again, all these are things that we have seen before. And then we look at stock A's return under this scenario, scenario one, two, and three, versus the expected return on stock A. But instead of squaring it, we now look at simultaneously how stock B does. How does stock B perform in the same scenario, for example, scenario one versus stock B? So let's take a look at an example and see how we compute this. So we're going to use the same example that we have seen before, stock A and stock B. So to compute the covariance, what we're going to do is we'll again take one scenario at a time. So the first scenario, scenario one is a boom. So there's a probability, there's a 20% probability that will happen. And when that happens, our stock is going to return 40%. Um, I'm going to ask you to pause the video if you don't have it handy with you to look back at the expected return for stock A that we computed in the last video. So welcome back. The expected return for stock A that we computed in the last video is 9.1%. And so in scenario A, when the stock market is a boom, our stock A returns 40% when we're expecting only 9.1%. And then for stock B, we get a return of 5% when we're expecting, again, look up the expected return for stock B, we're expecting a 3.6% return. So that's our... Uh, value for scenario one. So remember, we have to add up all our scenario. In this case, we have three scenarios. In the second scenario, which is uh, neutral, our probability of that scenario occurring is 30%. And when that happens, stock A returns 12%, versus an expectation of 9.1%. And stock B also returns 12%, versus an expectation of 3.6%. Now we're going to add the last scenario, which is the economy is going to go into a bust, and there's a 50% chance of that happening. When that happens, the A will lose 5% when we're expecting 9.1%. And stock B is going to lose 2% when we were expecting 3.6%. So that is going to give us our covariance. As you can see, these numbers are really, really small. So when we compute our covariance, um, I take it up to six decimal places. It turns out that the covariance between stock A and stock B is 0 0.005544. Now, this number doesn't give us a whole lot of information other than the fact that they, the, the number is positive. And when the number is positive, meaning when the covariance is positive, our conclusion is that stock A and stock B tend to move in the same direction, or that they move in the same direction often uh, more than they did in other directions. So that is very useful information. 
Next, let's take a look at the concept of correlation coefficient. Correlation coefficient is closely related to covariance. In fact, it's defined as the covariance between A and B divided by the standard deviation of A times the standard deviation of B. So if you remember uh, what the standard deviation of A and B is from our last calculation, we can use that directly. The Greek symbol for correlation coefficient is the letter rho. So rho stands for the correlation between stock A and stock B. So in our last calculation, we find that the covariance is 0.005544. And looking back, we saw we also have computed the standard deviations. The standard deviation for stock A was 0.1711, and the standard deviation for stock B is 0.061. It's very important that you multiply the standard deviation first before you do the division. The correlation coefficient for these two stocks turns out to be 0.5308. Now, the correlation coefficient is a standardized measure. What do I mean by that, and how can we use that information? Because the correlation coefficient is a standardized unit, we can use it to help us understand the, the effectiveness of diversification. The correlation coefficient between any two securities has to be between minus 1 and 1. Um, there are some special cases for the correlation coefficient that we can talk about. The first case is when the correlation coefficient is exactly equal to 1. And in that case, we said that the two stocks are per perfectly positively correlated. So perfectly positively, and that's important. When they are perfectly positively correlated, the, stock, the two stocks act as though they are trends. If you know that stock A goes up, you know with 100% probability that stock B will also go up. So that's what the correlation coefficient of 1 tells us. The second special case is when the correlation coefficient is exactly equal to 0. When that's the case, we say that the two stocks are uncorrelated. And if you know that stock A goes up, it gives you zero information whatsoever about what stock B would do. So the two are totally independent. They are uncorrelated. You cannot gain any information about stock B by knowing what happened to stock A. The last special case is when the correlation coefficient is exactly equal to negative 1, and that's just the opposite of positive 1. In this case, the two stocks are perfectly, perfectly negatively correlated. And that's actually still give us a lot of information, because if they are perfectly negatively correlated, and you know that stock A goes up, you'll know with 100% certainty that stock B will go down because the two will always act opposite to each other. So either they're positively correlated or they're negatively correlated, you get some information. If they, the number, the correlation coefficient is one or negative one, you have perfect information. Zero is when they are uncorrelated. However, remember our primary goal is to find out about diversification. So the big question is, when does diversification work? So think about it for a minute. The answer may surprise you. Diversification actually works in all cases except the top. In fact, most stocks in the United States are positively correlated with a correlation coefficient of uh, 0.8, 0.9, plus 0.9, some are 0.95. So they are relatively highly positively correlated, but, are not, but they are not perfect. So as long as the correlation is not perfect, diversification will work. So diversification will work as long as the correlation coefficient is less than 1. It can be 0, it can be negative 1, it can be 0.9, it can be 0.8. All of those cases will work. So in our last example that we computed, the correlation coefficient is 0.5. And that means that by combining the two stocks into a portfolio, we can reduce the risk of the portfolio without sacrificing return. So that's a very important part of diversification. So it's not just getting a lower risk, but it's getting a lower risk without sacrificing expected return. 
this particular example is a little bit advanced, but I want to include it in our lecture so that it can provide you with a better understanding. Uh, we'll develop this concept more in depth in an advanced investments course. So what we're going to do is to use covariance to help us compute the portfolio variance. I'll only go over the two asset case, meaning that we we'll only have two stocks in the portfolio. The reason for that is because as the number of stocks in the portfolio, the number of assets in the portfolio increases, the number of parent parameters actually increase exponentially. So it's not just that you have two stocks, you have two perform perform parameter, and you have three stocks, you have three parameters. It actually increases really quickly when you have two two stocks you have three parameters and when you have three stocks you have six parameters so the number of parameters increase very quickly so we're going to take a look at a two asset case so this does not apply to any portfolio but it only applies to a portfolio with two stocks two asset only so the variance of the portfolio that has only two stocks is a sum is equal to the weight so w here stands for weight the weight of stock A times the variance of stock A plus the weight of stock B times the variance of stock B plus two times the weight of stock A times the weight of stock B times the covariance between stock A and stock B. We're going to use the numbers that we computed in our last case, and we're going to use a weight of 50-50. Remember that we created a portfolio um, of 50-50. So we're going to Assume that the weight on stock A is 50% and the stock and the weight on stock B is also 50%. And we, then if you don't have the information handy for you, I encourage you to pause the video and look back up for the variance for stock A, the variance for stock B, and the covariance between stock A and stock B that we just computed. So all I'm doing is just is just putting in the information we have computed earlier. Uh, remember that I said that because the precision is very important for variance and covariances, I'm carrying all the calculation to six decimal places. And not surprisingly that we find the variance of the portfolio to be 0 0.011. 025. If you check back earlier to our calculation for the portfolio that has stock A and stock B in them, you'll see that is exactly the same number. And the same is true for standard deviation. The standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So all you have to do is compute the square root of the variance of the portfolio and you get the standard deviation of the stock of 10.5%. So remember, we have done, we have worked out the expected return and standard deviation for this portfolio, and turns out that it is exact. Uh, it, we can get the same information using the covariance between stock A and stock B to compute the standard deviation and variance of the portfolio. The advantages of computing the portfolio variance in this way or directly is that it is easier if you are looking at a large number of portfolios or, or stocks, or if you're interested in looking at the impact on the risk of the portfolio, the return and the risk of the portfolio by changing the weights. Um, so as I said, this is a more advanced topic and in, a, in the investments course, we'll spend more time looking at how do we construct portfolio uh, such that we can choose the way to optimize our strategy. Uh, we will stop uh, at this point in this course and in the next video, we're going to go over conceptually uh, how does changing the weights in the stocks allow us to create uh, the most efficient portfolio.